Thanks for being here, everybody. So I think we're going to get kicked off here with Frank Rietta. And Frank's going to talk about hatching production now. Yeah, it's scary, so, isn't it? Frank's already here from Atlanta, all the way here from Atlanta. So, awesome. so thanks for joining us, Frank. Thank you for having me. Let me get this uh, adjusted here real quick. <clears throat> get ready for a few things. Who's that? <laughs> and Lisa, thank you, thank you, thank you. So I'm going to not stand in front of the projector. <laughs> Unless you really want the, you know, the, the, the funds there. So my name is Frank Prieta, and I am super glad to be here. Let me tell you why. In my opinion, B-Sides is one of the greatest set of community-oriented conferences that you can be at. So, number one, notice that we're all here on a Saturday. We didn't have to fly out to Vegas during a work week. And if you don't already work in security and you don't have a boss who's paying you to be here or paying for you to be off to be here, this is an accessible venue. Number two, this is a fabulous place to get experience talking in public. So you can submit a talk and it's a nice cozy group. We're mostly friendly people. I, mostly, yes. And, and it's a nurturing environment to be able to get to some practice presenting. This will take your career far. And sometimes, like today, we're, we're actually recording. So a recording can go up on YouTube, and then when you're looking for a job, you can start to have, when people go look for you and look for how you are as a professional, they can, you have that background material that can really bolster your career. So I just want you to know this will continue year after year, and this is a worthy investment of your time, not just as an attendance, but as a participant. Lisa, thank you for putting this on. I don't know I, the I entire volunteer. Okay. All of this. Yeah, All there, of this. there are quite a few there are Yes, I'm learning. But thank you so much for everyone. So my name is Frank Rietta. And I am, my most operational title is I'm a web application security architect. <clears throat> so what that means is that I'm trying to make systems more resilient from attack so they don't get hacked. Uh, this is a little different than people that you'll hear at a lot of these conferences. You might hear about pen testers talking about <clears throat> breaking in and proving there's a security problem. But what happens after that report? some point a developer has to change some code. And that's an area that m most of y'all, I'm going to presume, not everyone has worked in the development organization. And I can say that pretty clearly because if you draw a Venn diagram of developers and security practitioners, the overlap is very small. And so we're going to cut right down the middle. But I'm going to warn you, this has a challenge. <clears throat> There's no way in 35 minutes for me to cover this topic and have it be comprehensive. I'm gonna tell you some things, I'm gonna share some data with you, and I'm gonna show you some examples of some practices that will help improve security. But you're gonna to have to dig deeper to understand this. And the, the truth is you have to go in two different entire bodies of work to understand both sides of the coins because these groups by and large don't talk to each other. Not nearly enough. <clears throat> Let me start with this one, all security depends on software security. I'm going to posit this as a fact. It's borne out over 20 years of experience. Long gone are the days that you can take a network security appliance, put it on top of a fundamentally insecure app, and call it a day. You will fail every time. Because no matter what you do at the network layer, if the, if the underlying software has a vulnerability, all the security consultants and um, network security and CISO organizations in the world cannot stop an Equifax breach when fundamentally the problem was that you had an insecure web application with a known vulnerability in its open source infrastructure that was not patched before it was compromised. And we're going to explore some of the reasons why that happens. And by the way, on that case, the entire C-suite's gone. Um, I re read recently another, I'm trying to remember the name of the company. It was like, the, the CEO was just replaced by the board. Catch me later, I'm going to find it, but this was just in the news. Was replaced 
by the board because of a security issue that ultimately was the result of a mismanagement of an AWS security secret. When was the last time that you thought something so mundane was something that the CEO's head rolls because that was mismanaged? That's the world we live in now. We're in implementation details, not theory. Here's the problem. In software development, security is a non-functional requirement. In fact, a project management professor told me this when I was in grad school. We were working on a project, and there was a problem with the requirement. I was like, this is not going to be secure. And basically, he's like, I don't care. It's not a functional requirement. That's, and that's technically true. It is a non-functional requirement. But what does agile development do? Agile development is ruthlessly optimizing for only the aspects that drive customer value. You are not supposed to gold plate the story. You're supposed to implement it as written, and the user acceptance testing, if there is any, is the only thing that drives. Code reviews ruthlessly cut out anything that is not directly related to what is stated in the requirement. When you have a non-functional requirement, what happens in practice is that's a requirement that's put off to the end. And history has taught us that you cannot wait to bolt security on at the end. I'm not going to cover it in this presentation, but there are ways to deal with this. Number one, making security requirements part of the definition of done, part of the user acceptance test. And number two is a technique called abuser stories. Happy to talk about that later. I don't have a slide on it then. Um, have you, anyone seen this meme? <laughs> uh, Leo is very unhappy with the deploy on Friday. Or you can find this one. Uh, I forget the character's name. Yes, <laughs> he he uh, is, is very much dangerously. So here's, oh yes, Austin Powers. Um, he's like a James Bond thing, right? Okay. Okay. Um, so so as funny as this is, we're all laughing, and if you go searching for this, you'll find lots of memes on "Don't Deploy on Friday," and this makes me sad because what does that fundamentally tell you? Deploys are dangerous. Why are deploys dangerous? We're afraid they're going to break things. It's, it's not going to work, and you're going to be working all weekend to fix it. I would say don't live by fear. And the reason that it's if your deploy is dangerous, that you can't deploy on Friday, then you should be going about fixing that so you could deploy on Friday, and you could have confidence that the software will work correctly. And I'm going to talk about a way to get that confidence. So what we're going to cover today is really six things. Number one, about why is patching so slow? I'm going to show you just a little bit of data on that, and we'll talk about it. Number two, I'm going to paint a picture of the ideal of test-driven development. Do I expect you to go from here and go talk to your developers and get them to actually practice TDD? Not really. But we're going to talk about the ideal for a minute and why that is the ideal. Um, talk a little bit about fixing bugs and legacy code that doesn't have tests. And I have a book recommendation on that. Um, and I'm going to give a demonstration. I said live, but then I decided, you know what, I'm going to record it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to hit play, and we'll talk about what you're seeing. Um, but it is recorded on this laptop as a screen recording, so it's live as of Thursday. So it's real. And a little bit about continuous integration and continuous deployment and integrating with GitHub. Who uses GitHub or has heard about it? Awesome. This is going to be very applicable um, to everyone. So why is patching so slow? So number one, it is slow. So this is uh, some data by T-Cell in 2018. They've since been acquired by Rapid7 and took this paper down. It's all <laughs> redirects to Rapid7's homepage. If anyone wants the paper, I'll give it to you. And I'm going to try to find a copy where that lived post-merger. But this is the data. All security, re um, regardless of severity, 38 days to patch production. For the most critical high vulnerabilities, 34 days. 34 days is an eternity to get hacked. Oldest unpatched in their data, 340 days. I don't believe that. I believe there's things older than that, but that was in their data. So number one, why does this happen? No one's around to do the work anymore. One of the mistakes companies make time and time again is software development seen as a capital expenditure. Once the project is done, the team moves on to another project, or they were an outsourced firm and their contract is not renewed. There are no developers left to fix it. That's not how software works. 
because your environment is changing. You're going to have to fix things. We long term need to change the thinking of software development. There's a reason Microsoft has gone to the subscription model. We need to start thinking about why in our own internal companies you never go to developer zero on any project that's a production system. But that's a little bit bigger than today. Number two, change is hard. It's really hard to figure out how to change something and it takes time and people and resources and back to point one. Change breaks things. The butterfly effect is incredibly real in software. You change one thing over here and something crazy happens somewhere completely different. There's a lot of reasons this happens. There's something called the solid principles in software. One of them is the single responsibility principle. It's violated all the time. What you end up with is that one module in the software is serving two masters and very poorly. So if you change something for one side, it breaks it for someone else. Um, another one is the uh, that happens all the time is uh, uncontrollable cyclomatic complexity. Methods become too big. You have too many branch conditions. Uh, if this, else, then this, that, other thing. <clears throat> and you end up with these monster 800 line long methods that are just basically spaghetti code and very difficult to wrap your heads around. You don't know all the dependencies. You change a system here and you don't realize that another group here is using your web API and, and depended on a quirk that you created. Um, so changing this breaks it for them. Or even within your own system, you don't realize that your library that you're using in Java actually has a dependency on another library, that has a dependency on another library, it has a dependency on a third library that has like an OS dependency. Like there can be a lot of details that can end up breaking things. You don't generally think about all these. And spaghetti code can be real. This is a patch panel. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but it's pretty funny. And at the end of the day, lack of confidence. You just don't have confidence that your changes aren't going to break the system. So it takes us a long time, and it's a very manual process. So I changed some code. Does it just magically get to production most of the time? I probably have to send some emails, and someone has to test it. Then they're like, oh, I gotta make test data, and then they're gonna manually test it, where they're gonna click on things for a while to decide whether it's good enough, and then someone else gets an email. This is the old way of deploying things, and it does not scale. And at the end of the day, there is absolutely plenty of time to get hacked before all that stuff happens. So one way to reduce this time is have confidence. What should happen is that a computer, without human intervention, should deploy to production once all the tests have passed. Is that scary? There's a pre tested, it's not scary. That's right. It depends on how well automation <laughs> So how do we get that level of automated testing that can provide that level of confidence that the system's working? <laughs> yes, I am going to be talking about that. So Martin, uh, Robert Martin agrees with me when he wrote almost 16 years ago. <clears throat> and this is one of the Agile Manifesto signatories, by the way. He said, it is irresponsible for a developer to ship a line of code that he or she has not executed any unit test for. And one of the best ways to make sure you have not shipped a line of code without testing is to practice test-driven development. So what is this thing? It gives a strong test coverage, it catches regressions, catches critical security mistakes. There's three basic rules. <clears throat> the first rule, don't write a line of production code without a corresponding failing test. There's two words I'm going to focus on here. One, production, and failing test. So what does this mean? Um, it does not. There are some purists who will argue that you have to write the test before you write any code. That's not what this is saying here. It's saying production code. It is completely acceptable to write experimental code to test an idea or to understand the problem space you're working with. I do that all the time. I throw a binding.pry in the... In, in a Rails context, and I can experiment with it. You can do the same thing in Java. 
So I'm going to write a failing test. By and large, I'm not going to do the implementation without saying, here's what it's going to do. <clears throat> I don't write too many failing tests without writing production code. I don't make this grand test suite from start to finish and then start coding. Two things happen when you do that. One, you say, oh, that's like a testing group's job to write the test. That does not work. It has to be the developers that are working on features who write these tests. Secondly, um, I may be wrong. If I write all the tests up front, I'm going to end up rewriting them anyway because I'm going to discover, you know, oh, I had a better idea about how to do that. So don't go too far. Save time and money. <clears throat> don't write more production code than is, is sufficient for, the path, for it to pass. Don't go plate the thing, basically. So this is Robert Monkton's list, and it's a good one. And if you do this thing, you're like Chuck, and you don't need to debug your code. I'm just kidding, but it's fun. So the way this works, basically, is again, you, you start, you have a failing test, and it actually prints red. Like when you run the test suite, it's red. So then you implement, and it once it turns green, you can refactor. By the way, refactoring is a special term. If you, if you read the refactoring book by, by, um, by Martin Fowler, <clears throat> he defines it as such. You basically, the fan, you don't change the functionality when you refactor. You only change the implementation. You break it apart, you make it easier to read, maybe you optimize it a little bit. The fancy word for that is you hold the functionality invariant. And you don't change the test suite, by and large. You, if you don't have a test suite, you get it first. That's a great book, by the way. Go, read that. So what types of tests do we have? Number one, I mentioned something already. The debugger. That is a completely valid test to write. Now, is it going to live that way? It's very ephemeral, right? I'm just in the console. I'm learning how the system is going to work or, or what objects I have access to. But then I can take that work that I did in the debugger, and I can actually turn that into something that lives in the test suite. And there's two general types of tests in the test suite. Number one, you have unit testing. This is what most people have heard this term, like JUnit. Oh, okay. <clears throat> um, unit testing could be things like the automated code analysis, like your SAS. Uh, JUnit is like this. You, you're like maybe testing a function within a class or the class's behavior. The other one is integration testing. This could be browser tests. So you can use a tool called Selenium, and you can actually load the load the page up and click on things and interact with it as a user would. And you can create tests to actually exercise the application end-to-end. -end. It's called end-to-end -end testing. <clears throat> Request tests are often like Selenium tests, except instead of using the browser, it's like curl statements going up to the server. And then you can make assertions about what comes back or how it handles inputs or different things. And this is a great way to turn a report of a vulnerability into an automated test. Um, I'm going to say, oh, there was one more point. Feedback from production via an exception monitoring. As much as I like to say we, we can ship things perfectly, this is a very valuable way. I will caution you. Oftentimes, these tools like Rollbar and others will collect PII, like users' names and emails that are, that are part of the authentication. You do have to often set up filtering um, to avoid overclassification of your exception data. So there are some challenges there, but it's incredibly valuable. This is controversial. I think integration testing is more important than unit testing. Um, unit testing is more important for TDD. It's very hard to actually TDD integration testing because it's slow. It takes a long time to boot up that browser. And one of the things that really is needed is fast tests. And, and a practitioner would say, if, you, if your test suite is slow, that's a code smell of your architecture. And this is true. But if we want confidence that we can deploy to production without human intervention, we need end-to-end -end testing. So there's a balance to strike there. Um, I have seen too many times the test suite falls into a state of disrepair because of unuse. The requirements change. Now, if you run it, it's false. It, it fails, and then we ignore it. And that is a disaster waiting. Because not only do you have no confidence, you have false confidence and you've thrown away all the good stuff that comes from having invested in building this in the first place. Here's a build drill and an illustration. The unit test pass, the lock works just fine, but it's a sliding door. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of a pointless, pointless thing. So I'm going to show an example. <clears throat> of doing an integration test. Come 
we know why the hourglass stays on. <clears throat> so I pre-recorded this. I'll describe what you're saying. Here. <clears throat> so what we have here is a capybara spec for the home page. And it had a simple test that just asserted that when it visits the home page, it sees the text it's expecting. So I'm going to run the test suite. Actually, I'm going to run a specific test. <clears throat> a little bit faster. And it loads up in Chrome, and it's done. And so now I have the second test where I'm going to make an assertion about the email field actually only taking an email. There's a front-end only validation. So I'm going to visit the root path, and I'm going to do a little experiment here. I'm going to throw in a binding.fried rate point, and then execute the test. And it's going to stop execution at that point. And so the browser loaded. You can see that Chrome is being controlled by the test software, and we have an email field. And I'm going to show you what it does here. If I type Bob and hit subscribe, the front end says, hey, that's not really an email. So this is all happening in, in HTML5. It's not even a uh, back-end thing. So I'm going to exit the breakpoint. And now I'm going to start making an assertion. So I'm going to use Capybara to tell Selenium to fill in the email field with the word Bob. And then have it click on the button. And then I'm going to throw the breakpoint again. So we're going to run this again. So I'm, I'm just going through a very rapid cycle where I'm just experimenting with what I'm doing. And so, yep, there's the message that I want. That's good. I'm going to close out of this and finish this off. I'm going to paste this because it's a little bit gnarly. But this is to get the validation message uh, into the test feed. So it's just something that lives on that native component. And then I'm going to make the assertion about my test here. So exit, run again. And uh, OK, what happened was is I didn't actually save the file. Doing that again. And now both tests pass. And now from here until eternity, the automated test suite will execute that test until such time that we change the requirements and have a reason to do so. So that didn't that was real time. That would have been, you know, yes, it's an example app, but you can see you start getting into a pattern where you just do a thing, do a thing, and then you're creating this as you go. So let's talk about fixing security bugs. So we have to change software to fix bugs. Um, so given a defect, how do you do that? There's two basic industry approaches. There's the one called edit and pray. I'm going to change stuff and hope it didn't break anything. <laughs> uh, this is very common. <laughs> uh, and then that's when you end up with the, the commit like this fixes it, then the next commit, this no, this one really fixes it, and then the customer service thing, like this broke it, and then, oh, this one really, really, really fixes it. So you, it's just, uh, it's a mess. The other is cover and modify. This is what um, Michael Feathers uh, calls um, um, writing insufficient tests. So he defines here as legacy code is hard to change, why? I'm going to read this to you. In the industry, legacy code is often used as a slang term for difficult to change code that we don't understand. But over the years of working with teams, helping them get past serious code problems, I've arrived at a different definition. To me, legacy code is simply code without tests. So what do we do when we need to fix vulnerabilities and have to change code to do that? He gives us an algorithm, basically. Um, identify change points. So, where am I going to be able to change things? Especially Now remember, this is legacy code. This is code that wasn't written with TDD. This is basically the real world. You're going to pull up a file. You're going to take off your glasses and put your hand in your, your face, in your hands. And you're like, how is this in our code base? This is horrible. And so you're going to try to figure out what you can do with it. Then the next step is to find the test points. How am I going to actually write tests to exercise this. And there's all sorts of ways, right? Like if you're TDD, you're a really nice little test. Sometimes you just have to say, okay, here's an ugly, gnarly black box. And I'm going to test the inputs and the outputs. Mortgage calculator, numbers in, I expect this. And after I have a good, decent number of tests, I'm like, okay, I think I understand the box 
that is this gnarly calculator and now I can go in and make a change and at least I know, given this input, I still get the expected output. I haven't broken it. So how am I gonna test it? Break out the dependencies. So you end up with the interchangeable spaghetti code. You need to do some stuff, write some tests, and then make the change and refactor. So you don't refactor without the test first. You need some safety net that you didn't change how it worked, that you didn't change what needs to be held in variant, and you can't depend on your intuition for that. Especially in a team where you have lots of people and then communication breaks down and someone doesn't understand, it's a mess. So if you do test-driven development, it enables continuous deployment. Update, test run, pass, automatic deploy. That's pretty nice. So let's talk about that. So what are some of the prerequisites for having a CI CD environment? Uh, developers need to write automated tests. I've kind of been talking about that this whole time. It's the developers that need to test. And you can have a QA team and they can collaborate, but you have to get developers writing tests. It changes how they design software, and it's the only way to have the, the amount of coverage necessary to be able to catch the edge cases. Time and time again, without automated tests and without that discipline, which happens is the QA team may have what they think. So, you have what the customer wanted the feature to be, you have what the QA team thinks it should be, and that's what they test, and then you have what the developers did, which may have overlap, but is not necessarily all the edge cases. Oh yeah, of course it needs to do this, and they have that little thing. Or you, you end up with um, emergent behaviors that no one intended. A containerized deployment running test. So gone are the days when you had to go to the IT group and say, please, IT group, may I ha please have a test server? Please, 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 I need a way to test this. And they're like, we don't have budget to, for another license for blah, blah, enterprise edition. So no, you can't have a test system. Are you saying those days are gone? Yeah, they should be. <laughs> yeah. They are gone in some places. So I live in an open source world where we use Docker and we run it in the cloud and it's pretty much unit cost to run another instance or um, the software. It doesn't cost me an arm and a leg to get a new copy of PostgreSQL running in an environment. So yeah, that raises a point. But those days can be gone and in many places they are. Um, you need to configure tests to run for each pull request and make the master branch protected such that the software won't allow it to be merged until the tests have passed. And then you need a, a code review rule that another developer must review the code and they do their normal code review where you're know, looking over the quality, but they have another thing they must do. They must assert that the first developer wrote tests that on the face seem to cover the intended functionality. So a commit without test is rejected in code review. Once you do these things, by the way, this is how you do this in GitHub. If you are using GitHub and you have an you just go to the branch protection and you can set up protection rule. And this is what we often use in our work. We require pull request reviews before merging. We dismiss stale uh, pull request reviews. So if you commit more code, then you need someone, they might just look at it glancing, but, and then finally we require all the status checks to pass. And I've mentioned Git flow, but basically the way this works, and this is very common in development now, you have the master branch. So if you're going to work on a feature, you take up, you, you do a branch, what's called a feature branch. You do that work in your branch on your local system and you make the code changes that you need. And then once you think this is good enough to, to send up, you make a, a commit, you commit your changes, and you create what's called a pull request. And the pull request um, is, is a GitHub or GitLab concept, but I mean, it's, it's gotten pretty popular. You basically have a social media-like discussion. You have tools around where you can actually discuss the code. So you can have reviews, you can do, um, you, other developers can interact. And they don't have to be in the same building. It could happen asynchronously. So it's a really powerful tool. You can also make part of that discussion your automated tool. So when a pull request goes up, you have those automated checks like um, the test suite. Uh, you have uh, style guide checkers that can check to see that the code is complying with your organizational style guide. You can have other things that need to be checked. 
And if any of those fail, you can configure it to literally disable the merge button. And then you can check previously, you'll notice include administrators. So even an administrator cannot override it if the standards and quality is not where it's, it's, it's supposed to be. And then here's a screenshot of a, a repo with a pull request and uh, all the tests have passed. So this turned green and my squash and merge button became enabled. So if those tests had failed, this button would be disabled. I would not be able to click it. And so that provides a lot of control over your development process to take these practices that we talked about being good and making them real. Can you go back to the slide for a minute? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> and I'll provide a copy of the deck for anyone who wants okay. it. So I'm going to play the second demonstration video. This one's a little longer. And stop it again. Go full screen. We'll play from there. So with this one, oh, I ran the test suite. <laughs> and notice there's a failing test that did not come from my test suite. It came from a tool called Breakman, which is our SAS tool. So the SAS runs as part of the test suite. In this case, it identified a cross-site scripting vulnerability in one of the things that wasn't covered by a previous test. So it fails it out. So if the SAS tool fails, that's a failing test. That's another thing you can do to keep things from sneaking in. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, write a confirmation test, actually an exploit. So I'm going to pull up the relevant file. In this case, it's commentspec.rb. And right now, it's just the default. And I'm going to add an assertion that it doesn't display a uh, cross-site scripting payload. So write out the description, and these are written generally in, a ter in, in human readable terms instead of code-like terms to make it easier to review the test suite. I'm going to paste in my test payload, which is kind of naive, but it is what it is. Uh, it's a console log. And I'm going to make an assertion that the page itself returned a 200 OK status. And a second assertion that the page body does not contain script tag. Now, in real life, I might be a little bit more specific, you know, than doesn't contain script because you can make that pass in all sorts of ways that aren't aren't right. So, but we're going to run the test, and so now that ran, all the others ran, and we now have two failing tests. One is the SAS tool still failing, and one is the one I just wrote. So now let's go to make this pass. We're going to go to the place that has the vulnerability which is comment slash show .erb. And the problem was this raw command. Same thing you would see in, a, in a other languages. I'm going to use sanitize, which actually parses the HTML. It can't be fooled by a regex thing. And uh, now both tests pass. So now that I have a passing test, I'm going to commit my changes. And uh, see that that's right. I'm going to write a message. So, you know, in your commit message, this is another thing I'm showing, is how generally how we write good commit messages. You have a simple statement at the top, that would be like the subject, and you have an explanation, and this gets filtered into code review. So this is another practice of developers, is by having good commit messages that are granular and descriptive, you enable good code reviews because I'm being on topic and I'm explaining what I did and why, so that my code reviewer can actually understand why I made some changes that I did. Uh, in this case, I made a mistake and committed it to the master branch on my local. That would be rejected by GitHub, so I'm going to fix that real quick by branching off to my feature branch. And I'm going to push that. Now, my other computer, it sets the upstream automatically, but in this case it didn't, but I'm just going to paste that command. And so now this is up on GitHub. So I'm going to follow the link to create the pull request. And I can request a review from one of my coworkers. And you can configure it to auto send reviews to code owners and other complexities. So in this case, I'll ask Chris to take a look. And uh, notice that the tests are running. So the uh, and I click on the CI, and so Circle has uh, noticed the change and is building the test environment in an ephemeral Docker image. So it has Linux already, it has the node browser dependencies, 
and at the moment is preparing the test database and compiling the dependencies. And I can click over on workflows and show you, you can see things that have previously passed or what is running. And this should run pretty quickly because um, it's a small sample app. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this. It's about 40 minutes and it already finished. So because of that, I can go back to GitHub and I do need to refresh the page, but you'll see it has already marked it as green because that test suite had passed. Now, normally I, I would have it blocked until the code review came in. Just on this demo, I turned off that feature just because I wasn't really expecting my coworker to jump on this, like, you know, at eight o'clock at night. Um, and so I'm making a note. So again, you can just comment. It's just as easy as a Twitter discussion or something, except maybe more productive. And squash and merge, baby. Squash and merge. And then at that point, the continuous deployment would ship that thing to production. So you can end up, and that was real time. I mean, other than, you'd probably wait for a code review, but that was a possible real amount of elapsed time to fix a production vulnerability. Um, given a report because that test suite is very thorough. So it's going to, if everything still passes, we know everything that previously worked still works. And that's a very strong guarantee. So any questions on what we just talked about there? Or should? All that workflows that may have been GitHub? Yes, ma'am. Uh, now, some of it may be uh, GitHub organization, um, which I recommend any business use because you can also require all team members to have two-factor authentication, whereas if you use individual collaborator accounts, you don't have that control. And it's very affordable, I mean, and you can host it internally too, um, which costs more, but it probably per head is just is affordable as a business, you know. I think my GitHub bill has a... You know, it's under a hundred dollars a month, <laughs> which, given all the tools that we have, is really a good deal. Um, any other questions? Just a statement. Yes. I'm sure, when you have usernames and passwords as a code, which you shouldn't do anyway, but when you have usernames and passwords as a code, you don't make it public to the world. That is that is true. So that's not something I talked about here, but um, definitely private repos. Um, but secrets should not be in source code. And I have misgivings with the direction that Ruby on Rails has gone to actually do encrypted secrets in source code. Um, I've seen this on some Hippo apps. Um, it's not that the encrypted secret, if the encryption key is not okay, encryption's good. The problem is how do I share that secret with my development team? And what I find is the bad habit sneaks back in that now we just have, instead of having a big file of production and development credentials that unencrypted, which is bad. Now we have a big file of production development secrets that's encrypted and a key that's being shared broadly in the development team that can do both. And that's just as bad. It misses the point. Um, I have a personal answer for that problem. Okay. Uh, any other questions on that so far? Well, I'm going to show you all a few resources. So what we demonstrated today um, what you actually saw, um, I had a sample app in Ruby on Rails, but these were principles. Yeah, there's a, don't trip there. Uh, these are principles. It works in Java, it works in Grail, it works in other tools. I showed you principles, but I showed a specific implementation with a tool I had, because we only have so much time. Um, you saw our spec being used to drive these tests. That's, that's a behavior-driven development testing framework. There are analogs for other languages. Rails itself provides testing type files for every single part of the app. You can test the views, you can test the controllers, you can test the jobs. It is an incredible test-driven culture to it. And the tools are available. And that tooling being available is the most important thing. The places where people say, but testing is so hard, it's almost always because the tooling is immature or, or, or needs there. Uh, the Java core team, the language team, has had an incredible quality control test-driven um, uh, ethos to it since the 90s. So this does exist in places. Um, Selenium. Uh, you can use Selenium directly. In this case, I was driving it via the Chrome web driver and via Capybara. So that's a specific kind of tie-in to make it easy to script. 
But you can do that. Anything you can do in the browser. Like, okay, the other week, y'all, just so you know, this was painful. Everyone know, know what high charts are? It's like a JavaScript graphing thing. It makes pie and bar charts and stuff, and they animate. It renders after the page loads. I was able to actually test drive a bug report that involved clicking on a pie wedge, like that didn't render until after by using uh, our spec and cat and it took a little while to figure out how to target this damn thing because it was uh, it was it didn't really have a label or anything it was it, it was like another overlay but I found it once I found it the test works and now it will work every time the test suite runs um, and I showed a little bit about the dockerization so I use circle CI I can show you the the config file it's really quite simple and uh, the integration with github and uh, if you're doing other things like JavaScript, I would encourage you looking at Cypress IO and JS.js. That's good for end-to-end -end testing um, on the JavaScript side um, natively. My friend Josh Justice has an awesome tutorial on learning TDD with React. So if you're like, I want to be a React dev like all the cool Facebook kids, you can do it and practice TDD. And uh, if you want Ruby on Rails, which I like, uh, Drifting Ruby is an excellent resource. Um, Dave Kamara has been working on it for years. He's also a panelist on the Ruby Rogues and some other things. And you can use my discount code Rietta. He gave me a couple of months ago if you want to get a deal on the monthlies. And then uh, there is an article version of this on the blog. So I, I kind of wrote the paper first and then decided, oh, I should make a talk. Um, and I'm happy to show you all things. Like I can pull up that code base and stuff. So, if you have any questions, here's the time to ask. Have you ever used uh, Coverity or uh, American Fuzzy Lot or any of those other things to help with what you're doing? Are they open source? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I'm gonna, but the fact that I even asked that's probably meaning the answer is no. <laughs> no. Um, um, I just haven't. I haven't had the need to go to those specific. Those places. are like negative testing and kind of buzzers. Okay. Um, but. I think the Coverity and also American Fuzzy Love Best Buy, um, uh, El Camtuff, who worked at Google, okay. uh, allowed you to put um, um, feedback from your code as you're testing it. Okay. And it generates new use cases automatically based upon the feedback. Oh, that sounds like an awesome tool. Sure does. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it finds, like, it works just about on anything. So it's just something uh, um, that a colleague of mine and I wrote a buzzer um, for control system protocol. Okay. And we um, use that um, to, to make sure that um, the code coverage was, you know, because not every test covers every line of code. No. Well, so, <clears throat> If you're practicing TDD, you should have better test coverage overall. But I, I don't actually strive for 100% test coverage in my work. Um, anyway, that sounds. What I did use and what you saw me using was called Breakman, which is a SaaS tool. And so that's pegging on certain things. Um, by the way, it gives this app, the sample app, a clean bill of health. There is another use of role that it didn't detect. So it's not perfect. But that's standard with most SaaS tools, they don't catch everything. Um, oh, Coverity. Trying to use kind of like fuzzy lock or static source analysis or other security tools alongside the pipeline is the runtime. Yeah. Because you know then you've got, you you if you don't find a way to either run it in parallel, uh, if you put it in the main pipeline, then your developers get up towards the new source back. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a balance act. I painted a very rose colored glasses picture of this process, um, but um, you have to make cho choices. Um, you can some sort sometimes do staging where the maybe the in development I have the fast running test and then in the background before like final merge there's the slow running test suite that includes more things. Mm. Yeah. Um, but because you don't want to, I mean, developers are fabulously expensive people, right? Time and money and everything else. So you don't want to slow them down unnecessarily. But my history has taught me that. Given the incentive structures that developers have, the test suite will fall into a state of disrepair all the time if they are not required to keep it up and do this sort of code review stuff to keep it alive. At that point, you're worse off than having nothing. Um, so, but yes, that is a tension, right? 
And I said that earlier. I said unit tests are fast and integration tests are slow. There, you can, if you search for it now, there are bloggers who advocate that you should not be doing integration testing. You should just be doing unit testing because testing has to be fast. Yeah. Otherwise, you won't do it. Exactly what you said happens. Um, From a security organization perspective, you have to tune your balancing act. How much of it do you want to actually occur in development versus how much do you want to constantly be doing out of band in the production environment itself? Some of the things you may not catch until it's actually in production. And some of those you can't because you're doing things like compliance checks and all kinds of yeah. that are completely outside of the field of the dev team. But when you have a problem, what should the developers do? Who is the primary consumer of threat modeling, of, of reports? It's the dev team. And what they should do is write a user story. And there are two types of user stories they should write. They should either write a user story that has security constraints as part of the definition of done. That way it doesn't pass code review, it doesn't pass QA unless it's handled. Number two is they write an abuser story. So if you have a problem, the first step is to write an abuser story. It puts it smack dab in the dev queue with no choice but to deal with it. They can prioritize it a little bit. You could, that's a whole other lecture. Um, but then a developer writes a failing test that exercises the thing that you identified in production as being unacceptable. Now forever and ever, that test suite won't allow this thing to merge if that problem reoccurs. Yeah, that's the real culture shift. It's the customers getting into the culture to the point where they understand what you abuse their stories. Um, we've got, at least in my company I work for, we've got a broad spectrum of development teams. Some of them are right there. You know, the DevSecOps is their world. And then some of them are, well, still learning. You know? Right. And so it's, it's hit or miss, but definitely, you know, it couldn't be more. Let me show you a graph real quick. I had in the article version of this. I'm not on the internet. Um, it, I did an informal survey of the paid professional developers in the Atlanta area who are working on software, like in the Slack community. And um, more, half of them had never heard of the OWASP Top 10. <laughs> not quite half. It's not quite that bad, but it was a high number. Anyway, it's there's a knowledge gap, yeah. and that's something that we, as security practitioners, we need to adopt our developer friends and understand that we can't do our job without them. Um, you cannot fix security without fixing the software. Any other questions? Okay, we can try that real quick if you want to. There we go. Blog. This is the article. I didn't want to give you bad stats, but there's definitely a knowledge gap. And uh, that's what we need to work on fixing. Um, I don't think security is going to exist as an independent discipline in a decade. Um, I think that we are going to have to merge with the ops and, impor most importantly, the development teams to be effective at our work. And I say that again because that CEO that got canned because of an AWS key mismanagement and, you know, let's say, you go to the cloud and now what you used to think of as being just normal uh, security, like if that S3 bucket is not configured correctly, then that's a vulnerability. Uh, another thing I think is going to happen is we're going to continue to see infrastructure become controlled by code. It's configuration and it's testable. It is no longer a, something that a, a person, you know, provisions a machine and does something. So that's going to be a big shift in this industry. Um, well, it's already happening. You absolutely. Know, software defined networks, you know, software defined everything, really. So my client base, there's a single two government agencies that have some in like a VMware environment, every other client I work with today is all in AWS or Azure, but really AWS. None of them own servers. Yes? Yeah, let's scroll down. Oh, wow. 
Wow. <laughs> yep. And this was the real thing there? Yes. How can you do the stack overflows? What that is. I'm sorry? Uh, the, the big note. Copy pasta from Stack Overflow is what that is. <laughs> and, uh, hmm. yeah, and there's uh, another thing that will happen is you'll have a lot of teams prove stuff out. Uh, one of my clients that I who came to me, uh, they had a security vulnerability in an API that was written by an outside contract firm for an, an iOS application that they were rushing out. So every iOS and Android application you see is talking to a JSON API, and oftentimes those th that is really the wild west right now um, with with security. We I don't think we have seen the the shoe drop on just how bad some of those backends are because they are not being developed by IT. So you end up with shadow IT and apps that are coming in from external providers who. Security is not on the Our list of work. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So, any other questions? Or whomever, right? Anybody. So, the, the article goes into some examples of some of the tools. That's it, y'all. I'm happy to uh, dive in. If you want to see the circle, let's see. This is the Visual Studio Code project. Acts weird when apparently when you open a browser from education comment section. Apparently, when you open a browser from within that context, it lives as that app. It's a weird little thing. So there's that test suite, and there's a circle config which was largely copy and paste from others that I use. But this is the whole config for what says, hey, give me a Linux. Oh, I'm standing in front of it. Uh, this is the whole config for give me a Linux image and run all my tests. And then it was all check boxes in GitHub to link the two together. So it's really quite good. So this is what you call a Docker image. So I'm saying, hey, can you give me the Circle CI stock image that has Ruby 2.6 node and browsers so that I can run my Selenium tests? And so then that, that will give me a base image. And then I say, okay, here are the steps. And you can, I, in real life, some of these get more complicated because you have native dependencies. Like I have one app where we had to install a spell, which is the Linux spell check library because the app, as you, if you misspell something, it suggests alternative spellings. Like, did you mean to search for like this other word <laughs> when you type and it works really well um and then you have the dependency stuff and then the, the test runs then the security check one is nice so every night it run automatically runs the security tests which includes the bundler audit which is a rails tool that looks for published cves against any of the any dependency and dependency tree and then also um Breakman. Well, this one doesn't run Breakman. I've been others. I, I would also run Breakman uh, in this in real. And um, and so then that will open uh, an issue um, it, in the GitHub issues tracker if you have a, if those fail. And, and it will block additional from running. So once that once that triggers, you can't you can't developers can't move on with whatever else they're working on until they have resolved the, uh, I mean, they can work on it, but nothing will merge into master until the security issue flag is resolved. Um, the other thing is um, GitHub provides something called Dependabot, and Dependabot works both on, uh, I know it works in Ruby, I think in Java, and it definitely JavaScript. It, across the project, will scan for known vulnerabilities in your dependency tree, with your node, your Ruby, and it will actually open pull requests to bump the versions of those things to the fixed version. And then, of course, from that point, you either have to review it and accept it, but that also kicks off your automatic testing. Uh, so Dependabot will push a pull request, and then your automated test suite will fire up and test the whole thing. And then when you get your developer gets there in the morning for drinking their coffee, they can be reviewing these automatic pull requests and saying, looks good, accept, accept, accept. And with those things then roll into production 
um, um, shortly thereafter. So you can you can get patches on most um, CVEs can be done in less than one day um, just by exercising these tools, which is a far cry better than that graph we showed. I showed at the front where the average was thirty four days, and that's trivial stuff. But remember, Equifax supposedly was breached because of failure to patch the Apache struts vulnerability that was published and known about. We're not talking about some super, super secret, unknown, zero-day fuzzing thing. So this would have patched that within a day because the test would have run. Maybe I shouldn't make that assertion. If you develop software in this approach, you can patch very quickly. We're down to a day. You can get down even further if the organization needs it. And that's a far cry better than the status quo. Thanks.